Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today I'm going to look at the magnetic field produced by a steady state current and how do we use uh, the Biot-Savart law in order to calculate this magnetic field. So we're first going to review the equation which is written uh, in this gray box and I'm going to apply it to a current loop and I'm gonna show you how to apply this equation. I'm gonna teach you what all the terms mean and then at the end we want to apply it to simpler geometries than the one I have depicted in this figure. I'm going to apply it to a circular loop and also to a very long but a straight wire. So like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, we want to look at the magnetic field produced by a steady current. All right, what do I mean by this steady current right here? This is very, very important. Is that the current is constant, okay? So we have a constant current I flowing in some wire. And I have a wire here depicted here that's highlighted in yellow. Uh, the wire is the blue section over here. Now let's have a look. Now I've defined a particular point of observation. This point is the one that I've drawn here in the green, okay? And if I'm looking for the little bit of magnetic field, okay? The little bit of magnetic field is denoted by dB. We'll see why it's D just means it's a little bit of field. Now, that little bit of magnetic field is given by this equation, which is our Biot-Savart law, okay? First of all, there's a term in the bracket. The bracket is simply mu zero divided by four pi, okay? Uh, mu zero is simply the permeability of free space, and it's given by this quantity right here, four pi multiplied by 10 to the minus seven. It comes in these units of newtons per ampere squared, if I'm dealing in SI units, uh, I simply signifies the current flowing through that wire. Pretty straightforward. That's measured in amps. And what else? Now we have uh, in the numerator up here, there are two vectors. Uh, the vector DL is like the red one I've drawn here. This is one particular element of length along the direction of the current. Okay. So it's simply a vector that has units of length. So the units of meters. And the last one, which is very important, is a unit, it's a unit vector. So it has a magnitude of one. And the direction of that vector now goes from the, uh, the element DL that I'm considering to the point of observation. So I've drawn kind of a dotted line here that goes in that direction. And the purple vector represents the vector R hat for this case. Uh, the last bit is what appears in the denominator. It's an R squared term. This is reminiscent of the same R squared term that was in Newton's law of gravitation and in electrostatics. It's simply the distance squared from the element to the point of observation. All right, this is the Biot-Savart law, and this is what we want to apply to our problems. Uh, before we do that, let's do a little dimensional analysis to make sure this makes sense. So like I said, um, the term in the bracket here is mu zero divided by four pi. So the term in the bracket has to have the same units as the mu zero term. And I gave you those units, right? Those units were in newtons per ampere squared. Uh, the current we said had units of amps, so that's simply A. And now this whole term here with the vectors uh, divided by the uh, distance squared, the numerator has units of meters, which only comes from the DL component. The denominator has units of meters squared because it's R squared. So if I put everything together, at the end of the day, I get newtons per amps per meter, okay? This is what we call a Tesla. If I group these units together, this is what I refer to as one Tesla. So one Tesla is the equivalent to one newton per ampere per meter. Okay, so that is simply a definition. So now let's go, at, let's go back and look at the properties of all of these terms. Okay, I want to just, before we use it to calculate the magnetic field from a loop and a current, I want to make sure we understand some of the properties of this equation right here. All right, I want to highlight a couple things uh, to know that are really important to know about the Biot-Savart law. Uh, the first thing is it is a one over R squared law. Right, and that is very similar to Coulomb's law and Newton's law of gravitation, right? Both of those had this R squared term in the denominator. Uh, this vector over here is the vector R hat, okay? R hat is simply a unit vector, okay? It has a magnitude equal to one, and I discussed the direction before, okay? Super important properties. 
Now this multiplication involves two vectors, the vector dl and the vector r hat. This here is a cross product between two vectors. So it's going to be important to know how do you evaluate the cross product between two vectors. One property of cross products is that whatever I have here, dl and r hat, my resulting vector, which is db, is going to be perpendicular to both of those. It has to be perpendicular to dl and it has to be perpendicular to the vector r hat. So in this case here, both of these vectors dl and r hat are into the plane. The vector db is actually pointing out of the plane, but I'm gonna illustrate that in just a minute. We're gonna look at a few examples, okay? So it's important to know how do you evaluate a cross product between two vectors. So one way to evaluate the uh, direction of a cross product, we're only worried about the direction, is something known as the right-hand rule. Okay, let me just highlight this term. So um, again, the right-hand rule, I use it only to find the direction of the cross product between, for example, in this case, A and B. Okay, it's very useful also for magnetism as we're gonna see. So if I have a cross product between two vectors A and B, all you have to do is you use your right hand as illustrated in this figure. You place your fingers along the first vector. The first vector that appears here is the vector A. Notice on this left hand side figure that the fingers are pointing along the A vector. Now what you do is, see this black arrow here? It means you curl your fingers toward the second vector. The second vector here is the vector B. So you curl your fingers as illustrated here on this uh, right-hand side figure. All right, and what you get here is your thumb is pointing up in this figure. This means that this vector here has to point in the direction of the thumb. Okay, so this is how you apply the right-hand rule. Fingers along the first vector, curl toward the second vector, your thumb gives you the direction of this cross product. Pretty straightforward. Uh, I do list this warning down here. There are other versions of the right-hand rule. This is one example of the right-hand rule, and this is one we're gonna use uh, later on. All right, what if you actually wanted to evaluate, well, what is this resulting vector, this vector C here, which is the product between both of those vectors? There are two ways to do that. I'm just doing this to remind you, how do you evaluate a cross product between two vectors? One definition is the first one here. So you take the magnitude of each vector and you simply multiply them together. So these are simply numbers, okay, magnitudes. Uh, theta here, or sine of theta, is the sine of uh, the angle between both vectors. So I've depicted here in uh, the diagram here in the lower right-hand side. See, notice I have vectors A and B. The angle theta is the angle between them. That would be the angle that you would substitute in this cross product definition. Now again, this here must give you a vector at the end of the day. The, if I multiply or I take a cross product between two, I need a vector at the end of the day. So here I'm simply writing that vector as little n. Little n is a vector which is a unit vector. And I've got, so I've kind of uh, written that over here. Maybe there's no need to rewrite it here. So it has a magnitude of one. And the direction of this unit vector, again, it has to be perpendicular to a and b. You can find this, uh, the direction of this vector using our right hand rule that we just discussed in the previous slide okay so that will define that vector now the alternative way of finding a cross product between two vectors is you can write them in any coordinate system that you want but let's imagine they're we know the components of a and b they're written in cartesian coordinates so i know the ax ay and az components similar for uh, the vector b what you can do at the end is simply uh, evaluate that cross product by substituting those components in to this final expression this is something you might have seen in your math class you end up getting this result by taking the determinant of this matrix here where i've lined up both vectors as rows of this matrix okay if you do that these are going to be the components of your final vector so this here would be the cx component the CY component and the CZ components. So this is a mathematical approach that allows you to find the cross product between two vectors. All right, so our last section now is what we wanna do is we started with this equation, right? This was the element of magnetic field produced by a tiny segment. 
But imagine you go back to my original loop here. What if I wanted to find the total magnetic field produced by each one of those segments? That means you simply want to add them all up. And the way you add everything up in physics is simply by integrating. So what all I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate uh, this expression of dB to get the total field. And if I take out all the constants from the integral, I am left with this equation down over here, which I guess is the formal expression for uh, the Biot-Savard law. So it simply means we have to integrate each one of these terms. Now this looks rather complicated, but we're going to start off with some easy cases just to make sure we familiarize yourself with this expression and show you how to apply it now. All right, my first question is, let's find the, mag uh, the magnetic field at the center of the loop. So here is my point right at the center of the loop. Uh, this loop here has a radius. Let's call the radius, just define it here as big R. Okay, and here's my Biot-Savard law. So now it looks really complicated because you have this integral and you also have this cross product. But let's first look at the cross product, okay? First, let's examine this guy, cross R hat. Okay, so I've drawn a couple segments. I've drawn one here and I've drawn another segment here. They are different, but let's focus on uh, this first segment right here. Okay, um, if I write down what this cross product is, remember it is the magnitude of this guy multiplied by the magnitude of our hat multiplied by sine of the angle between both of those vectors multiplied by and hat okay so the magnitude of dl i just write it as dl uh, the magnitude of r hat is simply one that's a definition now what is the angle between both of those vectors let me just kind of eliminate that uh, green here and let's look at uh, the angle so how would you define the angle here well again you have this vector dl which goes along the loop and you have r hat which goes from the edge toward the center you should be able to convince yourself that this angle is 90 degrees. Notice that if I look at the angle down over here, it's also going to be 90 degrees. And it's going to be the same everywhere along this circle. Okay, although both of those vectors change orientation, uh, the angle between them doesn't change. And that's really important. That means here I'm going to get sine of 90 degrees. All right, what about this last term? The last term is this vector over here. For this, I am going to use the right-hand rule, right? The right-hand rule says you take your right hand, you place your fingers along the first vector, and then you curl them toward the second vector. If you did this properly, this vector here should be in the direction of your thumb. That means that this one here should be out of the page, okay? All right, I would get the same answer if I did this one. I'd place my right hand, my fingers pointing down. I would curl them toward the second vector. If you do that, your thumb should be pointing out of the page. So you get the same direction everywhere you look for this circle. So there are some simplifications here because look at sine of 90. Sine of 90 is also 1. And the vector also hasn't changed. It's always out of the page. So this complicated looking term, which involved the cross product of two vectors at the end, simplifies to simply a magnitude, and then the vector is always out of the page. I'm just gonna call that direction Z, or Z hat. Okay, just remind myself that it's out of page. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and substitute it into our Biot-Savard law. Biot-Savard says that the B total um, as a vector has to be equal to now there's a whole bunch of constants you have mu zero i over four pi all right now we have this integral and i have a numerator term which i've simplified it's dl uh, z hat i'm just going to stick it out here in the back uh, that's it for the top what about the bottom the bottom is r squared what is r R was the distance from the element all the way to the point of observation. Well, that is by definition the radius of the circle. So all you have to do now is do the radius of the circle squared. Okay, this is also a constant for a circle. It's always the same distance. Every segment is a radius away from the point, from the center in this case. 
So what you can do at the end is simply take this term and remove it from the integral. So that's what I'm going to do now. Instead of having it here, I'm simply going to move that term to the outside just to simplify the expression. Now there's no more term in the denominator, so I'm just going to get rid of this. And let's write it a little bit more neatly just by moving the z hat over. All right, now all we're left with for this problem is to examine what is this term here. This is the integral of dl. So now we have to think about it, right? All we're doing here is you're adding up all of the segments around this circle. And you're just breaking them up in terms of a, all right, a whole series of infinitesimal distances. All right? So you're adding up um, lengths, tiny ones, around the circle. So what happens if I add up all the lengths going around a circle? By definition, this here should be the perimeter of the circle. Okay, so this whole integral of integrating over dl is nothing more than 2 pi multiplied by the radius. That is the circumference of our circle. All right, so now we continue. So at the end, we simply put everything together now. So we have b total is mu zero i over four pi r squared. This whole integral now reduces to two pi r. And then I still have the vector z hat, which is out of the page that I've mentioned before. So now you simply have to look for common terms and cancel them out. So I have a pi I can get rid of. I have one r and I have an r squared. I have a two and I, here I can get rid of one two. And I'm still left with two at the denominator. And now you simply group all the terms together and you get to the final answer. Uh, B total has to be equal to mu zero i over two r. And this is multiplied by z hat. That gives me the direction. So that field looks like this expression here. That's the field right at the center. All right, so if you're given a current, for example, imagine I'm given a current of uh, three amps and imagine this radius R was say two centimeters. I could calculate a magnitude. You simply have to put the numbers in here. So here you would do four pi times 10 to the minus seven. Uh, the current I, I would substitute for three here we do two. Now the only thing you have to be careful of is that this radius should be measured in meters if you want to get Teslas at the end. All right, and you put everything in the calculator, you should get about 0.94 times 10 to the minus four Tesla. That would be the magnitude of this field. And again, it is pointing out of the page if I'm looking for the total vector of that magnetic field. All right, now let's now look at one other example of the infinite wire. All right, question two says, find the magnetic field at this point P produced by this infinite uh, current right here, this infinite wire. We have a current flowing to the right-hand side like this, and the point P is a distance A away from, uh, from this wire. So how do we apply Biot-Savart to that problem? Again, I'm going to first start by the DL cross R hat term. Again, if I'm looking for the magnitude of this, it's simply dl. What else? Um, multiplied by one. That's the magnitude of r hat. Multiplied by sine of the angle between them. Well, we're going to call this angle here. I'm going to call this, say, the angle phi times sine of phi. You can call it whatever you want. Theta or phi, it doesn't matter. And what else? I'm left now with some vector n hat. Now, the way you find n hat is using our right-hand rule. Right hand rule says you take your right hand, you put your fingers along the first vector and you curl them toward the second vector. Again, this n hat vector should be out of the page. That is the direction of the field produced by this tiny segment at this point. What if you considered another segment? Well, this would be the vector dl, okay? And the vector r hat would then go this way. Uh, notice that in this case, if I do DL cross with R hat using my right hand rule, I still get a vector that is always in the same direction. It doesn't matter which segment you choose, you're always going to get the same direction over here for this N hat vector. So that's great. 
Now, what's different from this one is that this angle now is not always going to be 90 degrees, right? If this segment is far away from the center over here or where the point is, the angle could be quite small. Uh, the middle one that I drew here, the angle is actually 90 degrees. So the angle does change depending on how far you are from, from the point. So you can't just simplify that term. But we know that the direction has to be out of the page. So now I, know have, I no longer have to worry about the direction of this guy. Um, the next thing I'm going to do now is simply uh, write DL. I'm actually going to give it a direction now. Okay, DL is actually a little segment in the X direction. So it makes sense simply to call it DX. Okay. So now we're going to go back and substitute into our Biot-Savart law. So we're going to have that B total. Again, I'm just going to write the magnitude now because we already know the direction. Mu zero over four pi I, the integral of, so this top term now becomes this evaluation, except I'm going to write dx and sine of phi. I'll still leave that as sine of phi. I'm not worried about the n hat because I'm only worried about the magnitude right now. And divided by r squared. All right, so what is r squared? Let me just write it as r squared, and we're going to look at our diagram. r was the distance between the point, which is here, and any segment over here. Okay, well, again, if I look at this figure right here, this segment is a certain distance away from uh, the middle point here. So I'm just going to call this distance x. I know that the vertical distance is a. That was the distance between the point and the wire. So the way that you would write down the distance r, r in this case, simply used Pythagorean. It would simply be x squared plus a squared. Uh, that is this distance r because this angle is 90 degrees. So that's pretty straightforward. That means if you have r squared, it has to be x squared plus a squared. All right, we're doing pretty good. We could substitute this expression down here in the denominator. Let's go ahead and do that. So B total, uh, mu zero multiplied by the current over four pi. And again, we're integrating dx. I'm gonna leave the sine of phi here. And here I'm gonna divide by x squared plus a squared. Now, I know we want to right away, and again, if we're integrating over dx, think about where these elements go. If this is an infinite wire, an infinite wire basically means that x goes all the way this way and all the way that way, right? So this way we have x that goes toward minus infinity, and here x goes toward infinity. So really my limits of integration here have to be like this and like this. Now the only thing that prevents us from evaluating this integral now is, well, we have two terms that depend on x. I, we talked about how this angle also depends on x because you can see when the angle is 90 degrees, the segment is right underneath that point. Um, in that case, the distance is short, okay? So if the angle phi depends on x, but let's look at our triangle, right? What if I look at what is the sine of the angle phi? Sine of the angle phi, I just use my trigonometry, is the distance a divided by r, right? It is opposite over the hypotenuse. And I know both of these, right? This is a and r. I said it earlier. r was given by square root of x squared plus a squared. So now we have to simply get rid of it, okay? So we're going to go back to our expression. And before I do the final integral, I am simply going to get rid of sine of phi to have everything in terms of x. So here I'm going to have dx in the numerator and sine of phi, I replace it with a over square root. So you just have to be careful here because it looks like the same term. You just have to be careful on how you're going to deal with this one. This here has a power of one. If I write this one in terms of uh, exponent, uh, in terms of in terms of a bracket and an exponent, uh, this would be one half. So over here, I have to have three halves as my total exponent. So now we're gonna go on the next page and we're gonna finish this off by looking, how do you evaluate this integral right here? There are many ways to do this. I'm gonna show you uh, one way. 
and discuss another method. All right, the first method we're going to use here is something called trig substitution. Just call it trib, trig subs. I uh, define an angle theta over here, and it's kind of useful to use this angle theta as an integration. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, but if I define this as the angle theta, again, the distance x goes from the center here all the way to wherever my segment is. And you can have it on both sides. It doesn't matter. But one thing I could uh, define is a tangent of theta. Tangent of theta is the opposite, which is x, over uh, the adjacent, which is a. Uh, well, guess what? If I bring the a on the other side, I get a tangent of theta, uh, which equals to x. So this is actually a really useful expression here. Now, one thing you want to do is maybe uh, you need to get rid of all the x terms. So I can use this to get rid of the x uh, in this term. I also need to introduce an infinitesimal dx. And the way you do that now is you simply differentiate. If you differentiate this expression relative to theta or with respect to theta, a is simply a constant. If you take the derivative of this, it's secant squared theta. Okay, and at the end, you can write that dx is equal to a secant. I'm just going to write it as 1 over cosine. So if it's secant squared, it's 1 over cosine squared. And then you have d theta like this. So we're almost there. Uh, the last thing I could do, I can also write cosine and sine. That's uh, also pretty helpful, but um, I think we're pretty good to go right now. So all you've got to do now is go back and substitute. Now, what would happen to these limits? Well, for that, you have to look at this expression, right? What happens when x goes toward uh, minus infinity? Minus infinity means you have a segment down here that's really, really far away. In that case, uh, the angle theta has to go toward minus pi over 2. Okay, uh, the other limit that I would have would be when x goes toward positive infinity. All right, when x goes toward positive infinity, this segment is all the way down on the right hand side. Uh, the angle theta then would go toward pi over 2. And you can get that from this expression here in the red box. So now we have to go back and you simply substitute everything. If you're not sure what to do with this denominator term, another thing you could do is use my cosine of theta now, right? Since theta is this angle up here, cosine of theta would simply be a over r. And r was uh, the square root of that term, right? In the denominator. So um, you can write it as like this. So now let's go back to this top expression and start substituting in our different values to write things in terms of the angle theta and the infinitesimal d theta to finish our trigonometric substitution. All right, so b total, now it's just math at this point. b total is mu zero i over four pi. Let's be very careful now. I'm just still going to just do one additional step, and I apologize for this. And again, this term here is what? Um, x squared plus a squared was r squared. And then all of this is to the three halves. Okay, so be a little bit careful here. So if I simplify this, I'm going to now just deal with those exponents. This is r cubed down at the bottom. Okay. All right, now we do the trigonometric substitution. Uh, what can I do with uh, the dx term? So first you can just rewrite the constants in the front. I am going to be integrating now over the variable theta. So that goes from minus pi over two to pi over two. Uh, a, I can bring it out in the front, it is a constant. All right, dx is given by this term right here, All right? dx is right here. You simply substitute it into the integral. It's a d theta divided by cosine squared theta. What else? I still have the r cube right there. For the r cube, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this expression right here because it's the easy, right? What would this mean? This would mean that r cube would be a over cosine theta and each one of those terms is cube. So, at the end, you have to do something like this. This here is a cube and divided by cosine cube of theta. Now we simply have to cross out common terms. You have cos squared, you have cos cube. You're simply going to be left with cos in the numerator. Now look at all the a's. I have a, a, a cube. 
I can bring this one here out in the front. So let me get rid of it here and write it out here. All right, this integral now is simplified quite a bit. All right, so you have mu zero i over four pi a integrating from minus pi over two to pi over two. And here we're left with simply cos theta d theta. And again, these limits are only here because I'm going from minus infinity to infinity. So this integral is pretty straightforward, okay? Uh, the integral of cosine is simply sine. So you do four pi a. This integral gives me sine theta. It's evaluated between both of those limits. And now we substitute uh, mu zero i over four pi a. This becomes sine of pi over two, the upper limit minus sine of minus pi over two. Well, guess what? Each one of these is going to be, this is one. And this guy here, since the angle is negative, is minus one. But this minus cancels out with that minus. So at the end, this whole bracket here ends up giving you the number two. All right, so if you have the two in the numerator, you had a four in the denominator. Your final expression for the field produced by a infinite wire ends up being mu zero i divided by two pi multiplied by a. And a was, again, the shortest distance from the point of observation to the wire. So it's actually pretty lengthy to do this, right? So this is how one way you can do trigonometric substitution. Okay, it's still not really easy, right? It still has a lot of steps to it. There is another way you could do it. It's actually starting directly from this first expression here that was only written in terms of x and it involves looking at integral tables. So I'll show you what I did in order to evaluate it using integral tables now. Okay. All right, I'm going to show you how to find uh, this uh, total magnetic field now by evaluating this integral here by using an integral table. I used to have books full of integral tables. Nowadays, it's more common just to simply pull up Google and type in integral tables. I like to do like an image search and then I look for something that looks similar to what I've, I'm looking for. Uh, this is what I found. I was looking for integrals of this form here. And if I go down to number 29, that was something that looks similar to uh, the case that I was looking at because I had the same exponent, right? I had the exponent three halves in the denominator like this. So uh, what I did was let's go back to this term and let's evaluate this term here. Uh, again, we're evaluating under these limits, right? From infinity to minus infinity. All right, the other difference is this integral is in terms of u, this is in terms of x, but that's okay. That's just any variable. You can call this whatever you want. I could just substitute this back to x. I guess the only tricky part now is uh, how do you evaluate this limit? Uh, if you look at that denominator term, uh, you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because imagine you had this. Just look at this, this term over here, plus x squared. What if you took the limit when x goes toward minus infinity or plus infinity, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, if you take the limit here, well, you can forget about a. a is just the number, right? It was that distance from the point to the wire. I mean, if x is very, very big in any direction, forget about this, right? It's going to be negligible. So at the end, you're simply going to be, be left with this tends really toward the value x. But you have an x in the numerator, and now this here is approximately equal to x, when uh, evaluated under these limits. So that means that this whole thing here tends toward really one over a squared for, um, for this guy. Okay, so now let's evaluate that integral. So you have to substitute both terms in there. So you're going to get, uh, again, infinite over a squared, square root of a squared plus infinite squared, and then minus, now be a little bit careful here. Now it's minus infinity over a squared and then minus infinity squared, right? Or if you, again, this is not the most mathematically rigorous, but both of these terms tend toward the same, so they cancel out. Again, this negative sign is going to cancel with that one. I'll just turn this into a positive. And again, this term is, again, similar to that one when the variable is very, very big. 
So that means that this integral here is one over a squared plus one over a squared, which gives me two over a squared. So if I go back now and I substitute, look what you get, uh, mu zero, uh, I multiplied by a, four pi, and this entire integral now was two over a squared. And I can take out my pen, cancel out some of the common terms. I'm left with two, and lo and behold, we are going to get mu zero i over two pi and a in the denominator. That is the magnitude of our total magnetic field if I'm a distance a away. Okay, this is how you could do it now using um, integral tables. All right, folks, uh, that's it for me. Hopefully you learned uh, how to apply uh, Bio Savard law to uh, calculate at least a couple cases. Okay, I have uh, several other examples on my website, so have a look at them. Just search them up. I have a loop. I have another rectangular loop. Um, also a Helmholtz coil where I kind of use this result also. All right, thanks for watching, folks.